Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from eternally overcast Brussels. Welcome to this UActive event on the EU framework for monitoring forests. You can join, support it by Live Terra. You can join the discussion at hashtag EADebates and via Slido at the hashtag forests. You'll see it on the screen here. That's hashtag forests for Slido and hashtag EADebates on Twitter. European forests are vital for preserving native wildlife and for fighting against climate change. The EU lacks some knowledge about its forests given their vast swaths of land that are occupied by trees and this is a challenge in helping to protect them. It shows in forestry's lack of progress on climate target, an EU target of storing 310 million tons of CO2 equivalent in, natu in the natural environment is currently far off track and looks to be missed by 50 million tons, according to projections by the European Environment Agency. The EU framework for forest monitoring and strategic plans proposal aims to develop an EU-wide forest observation framework, providing open access to the condition and management of the EU's forests. This framework will use remote sensing technologies, geospatial data, together with monitoring on the ground. This will focus on parameters connected to policy priorities such as climate effect, biodiversity, health, uh, status of invasive alien species, and broadly forest management. And in addition to monitoring the EU's progress towards its goals, the collected data would enable better forest management and, take and allow for timely action in case of forest disturbances and disasters. And with me here today to discuss what the new framework for forest monitoring will entail, we have gathered an expert panel of policymakers and bureaucrats and politicians and forestry owners. And first off, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ian Codescu, Head of Unit on the Land and Use and Management Department at the European Commission's DG Envy, Tim Lemons, the Earth Observation Policy Officer at the Copernicus Program of DG DEFIS, Anna depanay Grüneberg, a Franco-German EU lawmaker who sits on the TRAN Committee and does just a lot of work on forests, and let me just be frank here. Ned Wire, Chief Scientist at Cybel Logical LDA, so his company does satellite-based environmental audits. And then we have Julia Bogna, Head of Program at the Institute for the European Environmental Policy. And last but not least, we have Juhe Nimmele, President of the European State Forest Association, Oyster 4. And now, off to you, Ian, for a short introductory statement. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Nico, and thanks for the, uh, the invitation. Very happy to be with you uh, today. Indeed, uh, the uh, proposal for a regulation on uh, uh, forest monitoring is an important deliverable under the, the Green Deal, but more so under the EU forest uh, strategy. It is extremely important. Uh, why? Because we need data to be able to know the, the, the condition of the forest and also to know what it needs to be done for the forest. You mentioned earlier uh, that uh, we have a wealth of uh, forest, but they are uh, our forests in the EU. They are also uh, very much impacted by a lot of um, climate change, unsustainable human use and activity and land use changes. And when we look at the forest, we look at the multifunctionality. So we look at uh, its importance for, uh, in the context of the climate change. We look at the biodiversity functions, but we are also looking at uh, what they are producing at the bioeconomy. And we see that all these uh, this functions are uh, very much stressed. And we need to know uh, where we are with the forest. At the same time, we see that some member states are very advanced and we want to build on this experience uh, uh, to have a minimal but comprehensive standard across the EU. So that thank is you, in Jan. a nutshell uh, <laughs> an introduction for the proposal. No, thank you for keeping it short and sweet. Off to you, Tim. I think your microphone's still muted. Well, until you figure it out, I'll just give it to Anna for a short introductory statement. Yeah, hello everybody. First of all, I wanted to state I am, uh, uh, of course, a trend member, and it's really important that we are uh, and yeah, decreasing our CO emission from TRAN, but I'm also a member from ENVI and from AGRI, and that's uh, 
the places where I'm working a lot for our forest. I'm also, um, yeah, by, by school of foresters. So that's a really, um, really, um, fi a really beautiful fight that I, uh, I have the honor here to do with you all. As mankind, we have always been depending on forest since the beginning of mankind. And our destinies are really linked with forest, with healthy forest. And uh, today, regarding our climate targets or regarding our responsibility towards biodiversity, that is uh, really the base of our life on this earth, let us put all the knowledge we have together um, in monitoring healthy forests and looking for them so we can really um, combat illegal logging and greenwashing in Europe and also have comprehensive and harmonized uh, forest monitoring all over the place, uh, just take the best of all these monitoring systems we already have to do the best together for our uh, forest for the future. Thank you, Anna. Tim, can we hear you? Not yet. Well then, Ned, after you. Thanks very much, Nico, and uh, good morning to everyone who's uh, joined the debate this morning. And uh, yes, as, as Nico said, I'm more on the technical side, uh, working mainly with uh, satellite Earth observation data. So I believe that this EU framework is quite comprehensive in relation to the monitoring of our European forests. And one aspect which is to be welcomed is that it's looking at the harmonization and standardization of data, which is something that we shouldn't add, um, underestimate the complexity of. Now, one thing I was pleased to see in the framework is that it's allowing member states to collect and manage the data that they are may be already collecting under the national forestry inventory or uh, other approaches and submit that in relation to the various parameters identified. And I believe that this should certainly ease the burden to some extent on member states. Now, satellite remote sensing is highlighted as a key technology in the collection of standardized information. However, I was very pleased to see that at, um, in the proposed legislation that there's also a requirement for in situ data collection. And I think what maybe does need though to be more strongly underlined is that this will be vital in the calibration and validation of information collected by satellites and other remote systems. Um, it's a vital aspect um, of the, 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 the whole data collection side in order to give confidence to the various stakeholders that will be working with the collected data at the European scale. And I'm sure we can come back to this more. Thank you, Nico. Well received, Ned. Uh, well, Tim is reconnecting. I just invite you, Julia, to give us a quick statement. Hello, and thanks for having me here. So um, I work on <clears throat> the policy aspects of land use, um, focusing on agriculture and forestry for meeting climate objectives at the EU level. Um, and so forests are obviously facing multiple threats that are impacting the ability to achieve its climate and biodiversity objectives by 2030 and beyond. Um, these are coming from extreme weather events and natural disturbances, acute biodiversity loss, increasing demand for biomass and um, unsustainable forest management practices in different places uh, across the EU, and also land use change um, occurring because of pressures from other types of economic demands. Um, this is causing an acceleration of rate and change in force, and it's presenting risks for the EU to meet its policy objectives related to climate mitigation, but also adaptation as well, and biodiversity protection and restoration, and also the sustainable use of forest biomass. So these multiple demands that we have for EU policy objectives are highlighting the need for a multifunctional role of forest, so to be able to balance different objectives, um, to have multi-purpose uh, uses of land. Um, and also to increase benefits of the market and non-market value of forests um, by providing more nature-oriented forest stewardship. So to achieve this balance and to achieve multifunctional forests, this is going to necessitate continuous monitoring of the potential of EU forests um, and also the risks as well. And this assessment, to, these such assessments are going to rely on available and up-to-date information that can accurately and inform ongoing policy discussions, particularly for the EU's climate framework. With improved data and monitoring from the forest monitoring framework, it, we should be able to develop innovative and integrated forest monitoring policy pathway assessment systems, where we can provide more precise information that can feed into scenario frameworks 
that can forecast future scenarios and outcomes based on different forest management alternatives and therefore um, do more up-to-date and more responsive policy actions um, to achieve different objectives for forests. So the forest monitoring framework can really support EU forest-related policymaking by supporting different monitoring aspects of key pieces of legislation, um, but also providing up-to-date information on the coherence of the entire climate framework and how it's working together, whether there's conflicts or synergies. It can help enhance strategic planning uh, under different EU pieces of legislation, like the National Energy and Climate Plans or the, the upcoming Nature Restoration Plans for, under oh, yeah. the Nature Restoration Law, and provide a foundation for new policies for the 2040 claim work, uh, climate flame framework um, where we could potentially provide financial incentives for carbon removals and other ecosystem services. Thank you, Julia. And Tim, I hear your microphone's fixed. Let's give it a try. It works? Ah, okay, luckily. Um, hello, I'm uh, calling from DigiDiffis, where everything is technically working now. Uh, we are managing the Copernicus program uh, as a whole. And this is, of course, interesting for forestry as well, because um, in, in Copernicus, you do have all these different uh, data sources coming from our own Sentinel satellites. We do have extra information from Copernicus contributing missions, which is data we buy on top of that. We do have a lot of in situ data, which are gathered uh, in, inside the Copernicus framework, but also by member states. Uh, and of course, we have the six Copernicus services, which are providing a lot of core data um, fit for purpose for many of the EU policies. One of the topics we are now very much concentrating on uh, is forestry, and we are uh, in contact very much with our colleagues in DG Environment for this, because we did have already for a long time uh, a lot of forestry products in the Copernicus portfolio across the different services, uh, like the Copernicus land monitoring service, or land management service already had a layer uh, on forest type, on uh, dominant leaf types, uh, on tree cover density and so on. Uh, we do have data on, on burnt areas, on uh, NDVI, indigenous leaf area, and so on and so on. So there is already a lot of data and products available, but we do know that uh, these were not always in sync with the new uh, forest uh, monitoring regulation. So we are working on that. Uh, we are making progress and uh, I hope this will become a very, uh, or this will become a very interesting exercise. Let me just finish by uh, my introduction by saying one thing: we are organizing a forestry workshop as well, Copernicus for Forests, that is on the 12th of March. Uh, so I guess this is the perfect audience to invite all of you to join that workshop of a whole day. You can come on uh, in person or online. Thank you, Tim. Juhe, a lot of people talking about forests and in situ measurement. As a guy on the ground, please. So, and thanks a lot for the invitation to join our, our virtual conference. Today I'm joining you from Finland and I'm, I'm representing Justafor, that, that is an organization which represents 38 state forest management organizations in, in 27 countries in all around Europe. And yes, reliable, harmonized EU-wide information on trends that take place in our forest is of course extremely important. It allows us to see how our forests are developing and, and should help us to prepare better forest-related policies within EU. But when it, when it comes to the EU monitoring tool, it is the trends at, at national and EU level we need to know about not what happens at the forest management unit level. Uh, and we, of course, have a lot of national inventories, which are the key, key source for forest in information at the moment. Earth observation methods, as we heard, are developing ra rapidly, but, but ground truthing is still needed for reliable results. That is, is very, very important. And, and a lot of information reported to international or organizations already exists. And, and as the information doesn't come cheaply, all new indicators need to be thoroughly justified. Information should be gathered on need-to-know basis only 
if possible, existing the internationally accepted definitions should be used. And almost all, since this new regulation proposal also includes the strategic plans, almost all EU member states already have national forest programs based on, on national needs. And in, instead of trying to come with, with a um, an EU model that would util, that we that all would utilize, those countries still lacking national forest program could be supported to, to prepare one for, for themselves. This is a starting statement. Thank you. Thank you, Juha. I mean, we've already touched on a lot of issues, but first of all, I would like to adopt a sort of forward-looking perspective. So, Juha mentioned the national inventories of forests. Jon, could you take us with us into the next two years? My understanding is that a lot of national inventories are due for revision as new data comes in. So what's happening in that space in the next two, three years? Well, first, uh, I would say that this is a proposal. So uh, it's a proposal for a regulation which is made by the Commission. So it would need to go through the, and in fact, this is what is happening now. It would need to go in, uh, in the co-decision uh, legislative process whereby it's discussed by the, by the Council and the, and the Parliament. And this would take a while. So we should not wait that this is, uh, you know, uh, or expect that this is adopted in, uh, in a couple of months. Uh, it would take a bit of time. Well, uh, once it is adopted, uh, hopefully, uh, well, uh, there is a certain time frame uh, which is allowed to the member states uh, in order to, to implement. Now, in parallel, of course, things are happening in the, in the member states. And as I mentioned already, the situation is very diverse in, uh, in uh, some of our, uh, of our member states. And I think Finland is one ex uh, example. Uh, the, the, the monitoring, the forest monitoring systems are, uh, are very much advanced. But that's not the situation across the, uh, the EU. In other countries, we don't even have national uh, forest inventories. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, in the meantime, the uh, situation will, uh, will go ahead uh, based on the national uh, legislation. So the na national forest inventories will continue to, to uh, go ahead with their uh, activities, which means that they will update uh, their data. But also something which is important, and I think Tim hinted at uh, it, uh, the regulation as is proposed by the, by the Commission intends to build up on what's already there. So it would allow uh, the member states who have operational uh, and advanced um, national forest inventories to build on the work uh, which is going ahead. I mean, uh, practically, uh, they are gathering information on the on the ground, and this data would be uh, would be put together and shared at at EU level. There needs to be some harmonization work once the regulation in, enters into force. But as I said, for the for this uh, operational systems. Um, there will not be too much hassle. There will, however, be more effort in the member states who do not have uh, this kind of uh, kind of systems. Maybe let me be more concrete. Once this comes into force, is there a risk that we Europeans are suddenly going to be like the emperor without clothes, meaning that we either have less or more forests than we previously thought? Anna, what do you expect? Once we have this comprehensive data set for all of Europe's forests, are we going to have less or more forests than we initially thought? <clears throat> I don't think that it's a crucial question if you have more or less forest. Um, we have to look um, on the, re the resilience on our forest and how they are capable to, uh, to really fulfill all the services that we need as Europeans. So that, that's the first, or even as mankind, because the climate, uh, climate combat is a, is, a, is a global one. And uh, I think when we are going to look in depth, we are going to see that, um, yeah, some countries are mon monitoring in a way of uh, other with other indicators. And sometimes we are not really speaking about exactly the, sa the same when you're speaking about a healthy forest, what it is. And, um, and, but that is crucial because on the other hand, on an economically um, talking, we see that uh, everybody in Europe is uh, 
um, is selling in a, in a common market that we want to, to have. But if we are selling in a common market, we also want to have the same definition what is in healthy forest and what is a proper management and maybe where there are risk of droughts or risk of, uh, of fire that is uh, uh, going to be increased in the next decades. So I think we are going to, uh, if uh, we are su succeeding, to take the best of monitoring that we have already now and that we are, um, as European, ready to do some work because it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be cheap. We are going to have a, a deeper discussion on adaptation on data to make them uh, properly uh, fitting together. Uh, they are really historically um, evolving system, these uh, national inventories. I know them in several countries. They are uh, really different, but um, I think that it's a benefit, a common benefit for all of us if we are stepping back a little bit on our um, own countries, looking on our, um, on our view in each country and to our forest and to see what are the neighbor are doing and what are really the, um, the value for all of us if we are sharing this. And I'm uh, to respond a little bit to your question, Nico, I'm convinced that we are going to have a, a deep insight with this monitoring law that uh, some forests are not such in a good shape that we thought, but other ones maybe are doing proper well. And that's, uh, that's the point on the forest monitoring. We really want to have this look and we want to learn from each other. And that's just a question that's on my mind as part of this discussion, which is going to feature prominently in this legislative process on the forest monitoring framework. Ned, maybe you, as a guy who's actually done this kind of assessment previously, where have you found the biggest surprises, so to say, with ex ante in situ data that we were maybe given to con before conducting a, an assessment? Where have you seen the biggest surprises in Europe, Ned? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we haven't done major uh, large-scale forest inventories in the, the specific work that I have done. Uh, within, uh, I'm working within the Life Terra project, which is uh, sponsoring as well this debate this morning. And there, within Life Terra, we one of the goals is to plant many millions of trees across Europe in the next number of years. And satellite monitoring is uh, one of the methods that's taken on board to try and track the health and vigor of these uh, forests because i guess it, it was one thing talking about existing forests but also there's an ambition in europe to sow um, many billions of trees over the next number of years uh, that's all very well as a number however what we really need to know is how many of those trees survive and how their health is developing over time and that is where remote sensing together with the in situ data can help and i just think we need to be very careful here is that uh, remote sensing is not a panacea by any means it's just one of the many tools that we are able to deploy in order to um, help us monitor our forests better so coming back a little to your question, what are the, are the big surprises? I guess I come from the, the technical side and I'm not the forester and Yuha is, is much better on that than I am. But I guess at least within the Life Terra project, I suppose my surprise was the, um, the, the potential rate at which newly planted trees uh, can die. In some of the sites we have looked across, um, you get 100 almost 100 percent survival rates in maybe even part of a site another part of the same site it could only be 30 percent so the actual conditions on the ground are so important and this i think brings us back to the point of where in situ data will be absolutely vital in this process because conditions can vary quite quickly even at local scales so just having a few monitoring stations here and there is not going to be good enough i think for us to capture the uh, extensive array of parameters that are proposed in this legislation so there's going to have to be a lot of work done in order to put in place i think really comprehensive and robust systems that can capture the um, the, the various variables that are proposed here Ned. I think you've already hit on a second part of the discussion that I think is going to be crucial, and that's the extensive range of parameters. Because like you have said, gathering data is expensive, and there's a, he favors a need-to-know approach, meaning that a lot of forest owners, a lot of forestry-associated EU countries are likely to adopt a similar position. Juha, maybe you could expound a bit on 
how extensive the data range should be and where you will one day say, enough, we don't want to gather this? Well, that, that's a really, really an interesting question. Of course, traditionally, what we have been measuring in, in national forest inventories is, is the, mainly the growth and uh, some other, let's say, more traditional parameters of concerning our forests. But perhaps the most important thing is that, that is there something uh, in, in new, uh, or are the new, new technologies going to help us in, in monitoring the forest health, which I, th I see as, as one of the critical things for the future or for the coming years. As we have seen, seen in, in Central Europe, we have had a huge bark beetle epidemics and, and I'm sure that uh, we are going to see more of those in, in, in different kind of epidemics in the future. And, and if there is something that, uh, uh, some technologies that would help us to see, sort of anticipate those, those epidemics, that would be really, really interesting. So, so the, the tra traditional pra parameters, as I said, cubic meters, hectares, and things like that, they are quite easy to measure, but, but the new thing is the, the, the health side of the forests. Thank you, Juha. Julia, you spoke of grand dreams of really accurate, future-looking scenarios. Can you a bit expound on what kind of data range you would need in able to enable this uh, long-term scenario planning for forests? Yeah, so I mean, some of the, the data demands <clears throat> are obviously going to be uh, extensive, particularly when it comes to, to biodiversity and climate. Um, and what's what's possible, obviously, there, there needs to be <clears throat> large scale conversations, extensive conversations about what will be possible uh, for this. Um, but particularly information is, is going to be needed on the sustainable use of forest biomass. Um, as we're seeing in the current NECPs that have been submitted by member states, there, there really isn't a lot of information um, about the impacts that are happening on the, the Lulu CF sinks or the forest sea sinks. Um, with the use of woody biomass for energy purposes. And so we're going to need, you know, better, better indicators for that um, and better measurements for that as well. Um, and then also there's the, the, the requirements, the indicators under the nature restoration law, such as forest connectivity um, and different uh, age and species. So um, obviously we have to know, you know, there's, there's future technology possibilities that, you know, there are big question marks about whether they'll be able to provide this information, but there, there are possibilities right now too with, the, with new technologies and, and remote sensing to be able to get a better idea of what's happening in forests. Sure, thank you. Well, Tim, you're basically our eye in the sky. Could you maybe introduce us a bit in what it means to have your eye up there and try to so all of establish a forward-looking perspective when it comes to parameters beyond hectares and cubic meters and growth parameters, but also these more abstract measurement systems of health and the like. Yes, for sure. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned the eye in the sky. That's exactly what we are. But this eye in the sky, I, I always come back to that. It, it sees something and it doesn't know what it sees without information on the ground so we can we can gather a lot of uh, imagery in a very fast uh, way and and over very big areas but we always need the on the ground uh, reference the in situ data uh, so that is it, it's very important and it, I'm, I'm glad that both uh, anna and jon already referred to that as well we need we need information from from on the ground from what member states have because they have a wealth of information already what we cannot provide so for sure um, we can improve our our data sets and and the, the end products we deliver but we will need to cooperate with member states and what they have as input and make sure that these things uh, uh, are complementary um, that's that's maybe on the short term if we look at the longer term what we can do uh, the Copernicus program is always evolving. We do know what uh, policy expectations are coming up. So the, the longer term um, solutions of Copernicus are oriented towards that. And 
there is, for example, the Copernicus expansion mission uh, called CHIME, which will deliver in a couple of years from now, uh, end of this decade, will deliver very detailed hyperspectral regular information that will be a wealth of information for the forestry um, uh, people and experts out there as well, because then you will be able not only to see the, the where the forests are, but exactly what the, the state is, what the health is, what the, the, the physical and, and chemical variables are of the the, the vegetation you you are sensing so that will be we shouldn't use the word too too much but it will be a game changer in this remote sensing thing another uh, example i want to give is the rose l uh, mission where as well it will be a big benefit for forestry because we will have much more detailed and better uh, radar sar uh, data so we are evolving together with the the needs that uh, our end users have and for sure the forestry end user is one of our very important uh, partners in this thank you tim while i have you quick question from the audience anna rusha is asking given that the proposal is light on details how the framework will be structured and she's asking if there's any more clarity on the eu institutions that will be involved in what roles uh, especially she's asking about dg deficit well, we are uh, in, in close contact with DGN on this, for sure. We have had uh, a lot of uh, fruitful discussions already on how these parameters sh should be further uh, detailed and defined. Uh, and at the same time, especially because we are managing the, the Copernicus services, we are in close contact with the environmental agency in Copenhagen. And it is uh, there, it is in Copenhagen that the, the the final products will be fine-tuned and and uh, ordered and delivered so um, with all the players in the field we are we are um, uh, discussing very closely to be sure that we are having a product in the end which is um, really usable for the for the regulation once it's in operation fair enough given that we have a lot of audience questions, and this is something that's deeply interesting to a lot of people that are watching on. I think we should put a quick segment where we just do a quick rapid fire round of answering some audience questions before we delve into the second topic, which should be ultimately the next mandate. First question for you, Anna, would be what should be the indicators to map for healthy forest from Lucas Lafont? Um. Yeah, the first, uh, of course, is a diversity of uh, tree species, but adapted, of course, uh, on the place where it is, where you have a place where few species are natural. Uh, but r r looking for natural um, natural forest uh, on tree species and looking what is planted or what is there. That should be really, a, uh, really important. Um, you, you can look at the temperature on the open field and in the forest. And if you have a healthy forest, you can see uh, of course, that uh, the, the forest climate, the typical forest climate is good. So you have also an indicator. Uh, you can look at the high and also at the crone, how close they are. Um, you can look for uh, a lot of stuff, but those one, of course, if you have some clear cuts, uh, big ones or small ones, or if uh, forestry is doing by uh, tree by tree, you can have a look on this, of course, because we have already now a look a lot of uh, of big clear cuts still going on in in uh, in, in forest in uh, in the eu and so you can have a look a simple look on that but correlating them with uh, data on the ground you and uh, really are um um yes sound information how many co2 the forest can absorb with this state or this state you can do a lot of work with not so much um not so much information. So we don't need so much information, but you have, we can have really good results. Thank you. Next question for you, John, from Varpu Sarin. Who are we actually monitoring and measuring the forests for? He's asking whether it's for industry or to fight climate change and biodiversity loss. I think you'd be best placed to answer that. OK, 
Okay, yeah, that's a good question. I think it's it's for everybody. We want uh, uh, to put this uh, this data together. It would be for the policy makers. Uh, this is at national level and at, uh, at uh, EU level. And of course, this would uh, reduce regulatory burden uh, and it would uh, uh, help, especially at national level, manage forest. That's not so much for the EU level, but we also have, you know, in relation to the climate, the implementation, for example, of the LULUCF, this would be critical data that will be uh, helping us to implement the, uh, the LULUCF. Then we have data for the foresters, uh, uh, carbon uh, removals uh, and the ecosystem services and also the benefits that uh, could be accrued by the, the foresters and the forest managers through this. So this makes them uh, an important category that would be served by this data gathering and also for the businesses. New opportunities, uh, especially for the small companies, uh, will arise uh, due to the development of a single market for forest data services. So these are just a few examples. Uh, of course, research uh, as well will be served by also putting this data together and coming uh, you know, to this kind of round tables of uh, discussions. Feeding future PhD students with data to do their work on, very fair. A uh, quick question from SEPI, that's the European Paper Industries, to Mr. Uh, to Tim. So they're asking about the forest unit in the proposal. How granular would that be? Whether they're asking whether it's 10XM or bigger. That's a question I will maybe pass to Jon because uh, we are working mostly on, uh, on, on with the data we have, which is the, the minimum uh, unit is then the raster uh, the, the, the spatial raster uh, resolution we have. Uh, it depends from with which uh, satellite you are taking the data. Uh, Sentinel-2 uh, is now at 10 meters. Um, the future um, CHAI mission, which I mentioned, is going to 30 meter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we do have, because that's something that, that uh, Anna just mentioned, we will have a uh, uh, land service temperature mission, also in the future, also in the expansion missions, with a resolution of 50 meters. So it depends, and it, it will be important to take the right data to, to have your right um, output, mm -hmm. of course. So I don't know if Jan wants to add on this or if this is an evolving discussion still. John, please. Uh, could you, uh, Nico, could you please uh, uh, repeat the question? SEPI, so that's the paper people, they're just asking for specificity mm -hmm. of the size of a forest unit as per the proposal. Well, so all the details uh, uh, have been put in the annexes of the, the regulation. And uh, well, I think Tim uh, mentioned this, we, we work with uh, DEFIS, we work with the uh, JRC, we work with AGRI uh, and also with national experts. That's why it, it took us a while to, to put the proposal on the, uh, on the table. Now, because I think many refer to this forest uh, 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 units, that's not defined as such in the in the regulation. It's not uh, necessarily based on. Uh, I mean, it does not necessarily have the same meaning at, uh, at as at the national level. The idea is uh, to have a breakdown of the forests so that we have some kind of meaningful. We call them units, uh, divisions of the forest in terms of homogeneity, so that uh, we are able to, to come up with uh, uh, better data and uh, clearer data, uh, you know, especially when the, the, the forests are really big. Thank you. Julia, quick question for you from the audience. An audience member, I think it's Marin, Florian, they're wondering whether forestry is an EU net or national competence, whether it's shared exclusively. So this is obviously a, a balance here uh, between the member state level and the EU level. Obviously, there are overlapping interests here between the two. Um, traditionally, the forestry is a, a member state uh, level uh, area and jurisdiction, but we do obviously have the goals, the objectives of the EU, the policies, such as the Lulu CF regulation, the nature restoration law, the forest strategy for 2030. Obviously, there is... There is an objective here to, to achieve, um, you know, increasing removals, to restore biodiversity at the EU level. Um, so I think the, the question is whether there's added value for having an EU level policy, such as the forest monitoring framework and, and other policies at the EU level as well. Um, so 
I think that the, the, the EU, obviously there is a demonstration of added value to having this level, so having more harmonized uh, information and better information to inform the EU's forest policies. Um, make it possible to see what kind of changes um, need to be made. Um, but uh, I think with this particular piece of legislation, and forest management is still within the jurisdiction of, of member states and forest planning is still within the jurisdiction of, of member states. Um, so this is really just sort of providing the information that would be needed for EU level policies. Um, but yeah, it's a, it does uh, strike a balance between the two competencies. One last question, and then we'll head back into discussion for real. Promise, there's just a lot of time. Juha, got a question from Artur Gessler at ETH Zurich, who is asking, why is one of the most important Europe-wide network for forest monitoring with harmonized data acquisition, like ICP forests, not explicitly in the focus for the ground measurements? Thank you, Nico. In fact, I'm not familiar with the ICP uh, measurements, but but in general, I think that all data, of course, is is important, and and we have to use all the data we already have, sort of not to invent the wheel, sort of again. So so you use the national forest inventories and and use the use other other data measurements that we are that are going on that we have. I think it's more more the question of of how we harmonize the data we have and, and and how we present it in a harmonized way for for so we can compare things within different EU countries. But but I have not been you know preparing the regulation, so I don't know this this ICP measurement. Are you sure? I'm not so sure when I look at the role of big forestry industry when it comes to these kind of proposals, but if you say so. I want to take us into the two years, but aside from a technical aspect, which Jon gave us a quick introduction earlier, I want to do is the political side of things. And that's inviting you, Anna, to give us a bit of an outlook. I understand you're going to be back in Brussels in June. Are you on the list? I think you're in a pretty comfortable spot, if I recall correctly, meaning that politically speaking, the last one and a half years have been characterized by a certain degree of trouble for laws like the nature restoration law and other files like the pesticides regulation. Do you think that there's still appetite here in Brussels to do a more comprehensive review of forest monitoring, forest management? Is there still appetite? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good question. Um... We should have this appetite if you're looking what is going outside and we're looking to data and also but of course we see now in in those time that uh, ecological questions are more or less uh, maybe a little bit uh, more freezing now and that we're looking to to other topics but i'm sure um because we are um realistic uh person we have to be at one point or another we have to step uh, to to take responsibility on that and maybe it's a point to to do to really speak out of a few conflict areas that we have in in forest and forestry um, maybe all our auditors knows but uh, i want to 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 do the statement we have my um in my opinion three conflict areas um, the first is um, doing business with wood, stem, biomass, and on the other side, left just the forest grow for climate and biodiversity. We have now some really good data that if you want to do the best for climate, for climate sink, you have to let a forest just grow. Uh, but we have also the next the conflict is that we want um, to have wood, we, hunt, we want to have paper, we have some needs on forest. And so we have the, the second conflict area is just on protecting them, but also needing them. So if you're looking around you, you have wood everywhere. It's a really beautiful material. It's a more ecological one than other one. So if you're not taking wood, what are we taking instead of this? That's a second uh, conflict of area. And the third one is doing business as usual and also the transparency towards people. Because we see that in a lot of country when you're monitoring and making public some uh, numbers about what you're doing to your forest as an industry or whatever, um, people are going to look at it and they know that uh, overusing forest um, is not good for our climate and for our biodiversity. And so this conflict of uh, area between 
between transparency and doing business is also not so easy. But those um, three conflict areas are not going to be solved if we're not looking at them. So I'm sure that in the next period we are going to, to go back to forest. And um, I hope that uh, all partners are going to be really um, open to discuss those three areas because they are, um, of course, not easy to solve. And um, yeah, so I will uh, hopefully be back. It's not sure the polls are really <laughs> going up and down in Germany as everything and in these times, but I'm working on it and would be a pleasure to, uh, to continue this discussion and to, to have a proper monitoring law at the EU level. Thank you. On the other side of the aisle, in a way, you have. Your industry is under a lot of pressure by external circumstances that you can't do anything about. Climate change is threatening forests, foreign insects, borken cavers and the like, they're all a threat to your forests. So what are you expecting from Brussels over the coming two, three years to aid your sector given the external challenges it is facing? Well, I think, <clears throat> yes, we are, we are facing some challenges, but I think on the other hand, we, are, we have some, some great answers to, 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 to some of the, the challenges that we have. For example, in terms of the, the forest sink, I think that the, the best sink we can have in, in Europe in our, our forest is that the, the, uh, or the best sink is offered by sustainably managed, managed forests. If we just leave the forest to be, be alone, I think it will lose its ability to, to be a forest carbon sink for, for in some, some decades. So, so the best sink is the, the sustainably managed forests. But uh, a lot of legislation has been prepared during this commission. And, and something that I would perhaps would hope is that now we, we let's say, take a breath and, and, and evaluate how these legislation pieces that have been, been put, put on will work and, and not bring in new legislation all the time because, because then, then, of course, the industry, forestry and, and forest industry it's very difficult to, to plan your business, plan your operations if there is all the time changes in the operating environment, and I mean changes by, by new, new pieces of legislation. So I would, would, uh, the best thing would be that we, we take a breath and see what we, uh, what, what we have done and, and evaluate what, what, what are the next steps. Perfect. Thank you. You, uh, you mentioned sustainable forestry management which is a term that I think all stakeholders agree on, that they support it in practice. But in effect, I think that your understanding of what amounts to sustainable is a bit diverging. Julia, maybe you as an outside observer, as a policy person, could you a bit of expound on what I would say green politicians like Anna consider for sustainable forestry management and an industry guy like you have? Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> sustainable forest management isn't necessarily uh, defined in the same way across member states and, and um, currently part of a, a project right now for the forest strategy for 2030 that is actually looking at member state level definitions. So you have uh, the EU guidelines uh, right now on afforestation and reforestation and, and also guidelines on protection of primary forests as well. But then these interpretations um, according to sustainable forestry management, obviously defer um, across EU member states, and there's obviously different indicators used that are related to you know different biogeographical um, characteristics. Um, so you're not going to find necessarily uniform definitions, um, but usually, I mean, there there are you know um, there there is a definitely a desire to encourage. Um, avoiding clear felling if you can and sort of uh, doing more selective felling, um, protecting certain species um, that may be at risk uh, as well. So uh, for instance, in, in Portugal, you know, you have uh, limitations on, on uh, felling cork trees. So um, it, it really is, it's going to be diverse across member states um, and it's gonna definitely depend on the context um, but the, the idea is, is to be able to sustainably manage the forests um, if you can uh, restore them, um, 
through different means, but also pay attention to, to the diversity of species and also diversity of tree age uh, as well. Um, so yeah, this really is, sustainable forestry management is, is not easy to define um, and will be context specific, um, but definitely there are practices um, that can be adopted. And, and obviously, you know, sharing between member states in, in different biogeographical regions will be important as well for uh, what practices work and what practices don't. But obviously, these are practices where you avoid, you want to avoid loss of biodiversity, and you also want to protect existing carbon stocks and, and, and avoiding emissions um, unnecessarily um, from, from felling. So, Thank you. Ned? As somebody who's done a lot of audits on diverse life terror projects across Europe, but is also a fan of harmonization and standardization, how feasible is it in practice to create like an EU standard, given that you mentioned that even in the same hectare, sometimes on one half of the hectare, 70% of trees die, on the other one, all survive. Could you please expound a bit on that? I think there are two separate issues is, is kind of the information that we're collecting from the ground, whether it is by remote sensing or in situ uh, techniques. And obviously, there's going to be quite a lot of variability, as I said, from at all scales. However, the issue of data harmonization and standardization, I believe, is a different one. And um, I think we have the Commission at least has experience on that. Uh, for example, the Inspire Directive from a number of years ago. Uh, looked at providing standardized uh, informa ge geographical information. And I know member states did struggle with that in order to put it in place. However, it, ha it said very clearly the, 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 the way we were to provide the harmonized standardized data in terms of the various definitions and the structures that were to be used and how we described data, et cetera. So in, in a sense, I believe the, the data harmonization and standardization part is just a technical problem which we can resolve uh, relatively easy, easily. So as long as I think there's first of all consultation with the member states on how they already present their data, we can come to a, a clear definition on what makes the most sense and then I believe it is uh, just a technical problem to some extent to present your data in those required formats. I believe the, the bigger challenge that uh, every member state will have is in uh, essentially collecting and putting together the data at the appropriate scales um, and at the, the right granularity in order to, um, to, to have the, the, the set of data, let's say, with which the, the Commission can then work. So I think we, we just need to be careful not to mix uh, everything together here in this, in this. Fair. An argument for keeping things distinct. So I've been made aware that there's a Helsinki resolution that lies out a definition for sustainable forestry management. So, Jan, can you expound on how you are integrating this into your proposal? Well, <laughs> I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an important question, but I would like to start with a distinction. So the proposal is about forest monitoring. It's not about forest management. So we are not uh, interfering with the forest management, which is kept at the uh, at, uh, national level. So this is about gathering data, putting the data together and also i think it was mentioned earlier that it's important to to, to understand better the, better or primarily the condition of the forest the health of the forest which has an impact on uh, on all functions of the, the forest when it comes to the the forest management there we are trying to put together some uh, well uh, the the best practice uh, and I think it was mentioned uh, earlier, this uh, uh, guidances that the Commission came with, and indeed afforestation, reforestation, and also old growth primary forests, uh, uh, these are two guidelines, but there was another one which was uh, presented by the Commission last year uh, in summer after i think it was two years work with uh, with the member states and that was closer to nature uh, uh, forestry and, and forest management but again this is not uh, legislation uh, uh, this is about uh, guidelines so the commission is uh, is uh, helping there and of course in this context we are putting together the best definition we are uh, of the uh, the experts 
So it's important to draw this distinction, you know, uh, hard legislation, uh, regulation uh, for monitoring and for uh, forest management that uh, we uh, have discussions which sometimes come up with, uh, with uh, some guidelines, but which are, of course, voluntary. Of course. Here yeah. in also? Sorry? You want to uh, comment on what Johnson said? Yeah, go for it, go for it. Yeah, I, I just wanted you to emphasize this. This is really on monitoring first information we have. And of course, we have some legislation that are really decided already now, like LULUCF, where member states have um, stated that they will um, decrease um, or increase uh, the carbon removal. And of course, at the end, um, if we are looking at the numbers and we see uh, some member states are not uh, realizing what they stated for and decided for, uh, we can, um, the more first monitoring law can help us maybe. But the first step is really to collect first data and uh, to have also opportunities for Forrester to have also maybe a discussion on compensation for ecosystem services by uh, by foresters or, or countries or region letting uh, letting grow or letting do the, the business in forestry in another way. So it's not that we that the, the 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 policy that will maybe come from this is already clear that's really um transparency and look for a state there is one point maybe that we can use it is on illegal logging when it's really clear illegal we can see it better with the forest monitoring but we could see it already today with the satellite images in fact but that could help us for uh against this but now it's on forest monitoring and really looking at data and not putting into um, management practices because that is um, is really um, yeah um, a conflict as I say before that we have to to do again and again and again and look what the society need at this point in time mm -hmm. but the data they can evolve and uh, and give some information at, um, in all state of, of, of this discussion thanks Anna but Given what you've said, and given the timelines ahead of us, the 2030 target for LULUCF, the carbon sink, uh, removals, that is on track to being missed. So, Julia, could you please expound a bit on, once we've gathered the data and analyzed it and let it ruminate, how much time will be left for action here in Brussels to ensure that the 2030 targets will be met? Yeah, I think you're touching on a really important point and is, is, is what is the contribution that force can make to the 2030 target and beyond for 2040 and 2050. And, you know, an, an ambitious LULUCF target is important so that we can move in the right direction that right now, I, you know, for the 2040 targets in the, the commission, uh, the commission's communication that it recently pointed, uh, put out there, it's, it's, um, it established that you, you would likely need a certain amount of removals and it said a combination of, of industrial removals and nature-based removals. Well, right now, the, the technological removals are a big question mark and currently forests are the only uh, currently net sink right now that we have of the land use sector. So obviously forests have an important role to play in meeting these objectives. But as was already discussed earlier, there may be a gap between what the target is for 2030 and then what's actually, you know, when we have better monitoring, what is the actual carbon sink? Um, so this is important that, you know, we need to obviously, if we're not on track, rectify this and move this, but also we need to make sure that we're not over relying on the role of force either to achieve our, our, our climate targets, that we really do need to focus on the reduction of emissions um, primarily. So because there's obviously fluctuations, there's uncertainties with the carbon stocks. So, so it could be that there's, you know, natural disturbances that cause massive loss of, of carbon stocks. I mean, in, in Canada, you saw huge forest fires where it was three times the amount of annual emissions that Canada produces over, uh, over the past year. So you could face massive loss of forest. So we can't over rely on forests. It plays an important role. Obviously, it's a fundamental role to meeting that net target by 2050 and even net negative emissions beyond that. Um, but again, there are certain risks in relying on forests. So we really need to weigh this. And, and this is where the monitoring comes in is, is where, where are we exactly and what do we need to focus on? Thank you. We're drowning in questions from the audience. So I would take 
one last one before we head into a round of conclusive st concluding statements, I'd say. I've got a question from Kai Schwertzl at the Thunen Institute of Forest Ecosystem. This one's for you, Jan. He's asking whether risk assignment requires the use of numerical, ideally process-based models. EO primarily enables a description of the conditions of forest of time. How should the use of such models be accomplished with the collected data, which is primarily aimed at collecting forest structure data? We're getting really technical here, but please, John. Well, I'll try my best to, to reply. It. Uh, indeed, I think the, the, well, one of the main issues we have currently, um, um, in addition to the lack of, uh, of completeness of uh, data, is also the lack of timeliness. Um, well, it is important to know what's the, the condition of the forest today and then uh, uh, cyclically or regularly to be able to compare and see which is the trend. I think what's, that's one of the, the, the main added values of this proposal is that it will provide a sequence of, uh, of uh, monitoring on the basis of which we can draw some conclusions. And of course, the cyclicity or the regularity of the monitoring depends, or the frequency, if you want, it depends on the indicators. In some cases, remote sensing, for example, allows us to, to go on a, on a, a swifter pace. In the case of ground level data, we have uh, uh, you know five years or uh, whatever, because it, it involves certain costs. And in some cases, we don't really need uh, that. So as I said, well, we've put as much uh, uh, as much uh, uh, detail, technical detail, on uh, in the annexes to the uh, to the regulation, uh, and all these more technical aspects are debated currently with the, uh, in the in the legislative process. However, some more technical details will be what well, we propose to be left uh, for, the, for the, the real experts, those coming from the NFIs, uh, national level, also from our GRC to sit together and, and see this kind of details. But the idea is to use the best data we, uh, we have. And because somebody asked about ICP, that's uh, probably an important uh, uh, point. And the regulation also provides, I think it's Article 11, that the member states and the commission may use existing regional regional institution cooperation structure. So the idea is to put together all the best data we uh, uh, we have. And we tried, and that's my last point in replying to this question, we tried to make the regulation um, uh, future-proof uh, uh, and also to allow uh, updates uh, because uh, the technical aspects uh, and the technology will evolve a lot uh, over the next uh, next years. Perfect. That's great because the ICP framework is featured, or I, the ICP Forest Network has featured in many questions. And there's another quick question to Tim from Marco Ferretti, who's also asking why not lean more heavily on the ICP Forest Network for their harmonized, quality assured ground data? Maybe if you could give a quick insight on that. Um, we we try to lean on all uh, ground truth data we can so it's a good question and i will certainly follow up on this uh, it, it as i said before you have no you cannot use earth observation data without ground truth so we have a, an extensive network of in situ data uh, with institutions with companies national administrations uh, it's working very well uh, but it can always work better and we do need all information we get, uh, we can get, and certainly we will uh, we will follow up on this. Perfect, thank you. One quick question for you, ha, from Sultan Kuhn, who's wondering how would you foresee the new forest monitoring legislation contributing to changing management practices of especially state forests. Of course, when, when we think about changing management practices, we should be doing the changes based on information. And, and if this new, new monitoring system will bring, bring us more information, it's, we, are, we have a more solid ground to make, make some, some decisions on, on, on management practices. Uh, so basically, that's how I see it. This new monitoring system can bring us more information behind our, our decisions. So you're saying, show me the data first, then I'll commit to changing my practices? Yeah, yeah, in a, in a way, because 
we are, we are not without data at the moment. We have, in fact, in many countries, we have a, let's say, almost 100 years tradition to, to measure our forest resources. And, and we have a lot of data, and, and that's the data that we have been using uh, as a background information when making the decisions for, for our forest management practices so far. And uh, let's hope that, it, as I said earlier, especially from the health side of the forestry, forests, we can get more information. And then there are some some things that have only been started to measure late, more lately, let's say something like the amount of, of rotten wood, the amount of dead wood in, in forests. Those are some things that, that, are, that, are not, that have not been measured for, for quite a long time yet. Well, and of course, enough. one thing, one thing that I might mention is that nowadays we have quite a good information about the trees in forests. But if we are speaking about carbon sinks, we have a lot of research to be done about the ground of, of forests. How, how much uh, carbon is the, is the ground of the forest? Uh, how much carbon does the ground have? So there is a lot of in, uh, research to be done. That's it. There are a lot of open questions. There's a question from this, from Lucas Lafon from the Chalmers School of Architecture as well. This one's to you, Anna. And especially, he's wondering how to estimate the amount of carbon sunk into the ground at a specific point of a forest growth. What's the, what is the best guess we currently have to estimate this? Yeah, I'm, I'm joining there, Juha. It's, it's, a, it's in fact a really difficult question, but uh, that we uh, see we have uh, a good correlation, um, at least in, in Central Europe. And of course, we have to do this work in each um, yeah, biological regions because they are really different everywhere. And the Nordics, you cannot have the same conclusion that in the Mediterranean area, that's for sure. But we see, of course, when the um, amount of, um, of a soil is, uh, for instance, growing, um, because you have a, a more diverse um, ecosystem, of course, you can uh, see really clearly that the amount of uh, CO2 or carbon is just sinking in this area. But we, we have some research, but it's not it's not enough, that's for sure. But we, we can we have the reverse, uh, reverse research. We know what kind of practices are emitting a lot of CO2. And that's for sure when you have big erosion of soil after big clear cuts, of course, the, the soil is just uh, uh, dying for uh, several years and it's emitting a lot of CO2. So that's for sure. We, we know which kind of practices um, are emitting. But to, um, to really measure the, uh, the sink, it's, uh, it's, it's a process. We have some good figures, but we have them really typically in some region and we cannot extrapolate them already now everywhere with just some few numbers so we have to do this research and we have to begin with what we have so we cannot take some policy um, steps um, just from the data we have to look at our traditional forestry also that's really important because we have some people on the ground they know what they're doing for years and when the um, the forest is healthy and can be uh, grow naturally that's a really good indicator so when the species are reproducing themselves that's genetically really interesting because they are adapting to the new um, yeah the, the the new and when you're planting them from outside uh, mostly you are just missing the the right genetical genetically um, area so that's a really good uh, indicator when you have natural forests that can regenerate on their self, they are um, mostly um, able to, 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 to safeguard some, some, some carbon. Perfect. That was not the specific answer I was hoping for, so I'm going to try with you, Leah. Or, John, you want to get in there? Very quickly. I think the carbon, measuring the carbon um, in soil, including in the forest soil, is under the, another initiative of the Commission, which is the Soil Monitoring Law. Uh, which is also pending. It was uh, a legislative procedure. It was uh, tabled by the Commission uh, uh, in July, so a few months uh, earlier. So it's a bit more uh, more advanced. But that's a critical information. We know how to do it. Measuring carbon in soil is more advanced than for other, uh, for example, um, uh, well, erosion and, and so on for other indicators. Uh, but the idea is indeed to uh, look uh, also in the, uh, I mean, in all types of soils, including in the in the uh, forest soil. And we 
wanted to avoid duplication, so that's why it doesn't appear in the in the forest monitoring uh, uh, law. But of course, uh, well, the, the the data would be uh, uh, complementary. And we are looking now with uh, with uh, with uh, the experts, with the national experts, into the best ways of uh, of measuring carbon in the context of the the forest. But indeed, it, it's an important indicator as well. Okay, John. When I have you on carbon in soil, let me just quickly ask, because my understanding is measuring carbon in soil or measuring really anything in soil requires a lot of in situ field work. Have you got any figures for us? How many thousands, tens of thousands of researchers are going to be sent into the field? Are we facing a worker shortage on capable field researchers to generate the data that we need? Could you expound a bit on that? Uh, not at all. Uh, well, soil monitoring is being done already, also at EU level. You are right, it is not done by remote sensing, but on ground level data. So somebody needs to go on the, and uh, take uh, extract a sample of soil. The advantage is that you get this, you know, what we call a carrot of, <laughs> of uh, sample uh, soil, and then you send it to laboratories, and then it can be exploited uh, for a lot of indicators. And usually it's done on, a, uh, you know, three, five years, uh, six years. It depends from member state. And we are doing a lot uh, already at uh, at EU level. Uh, if I'm not through a program which is called uh, Lucas Soil, it is not so uh, so expensive. Uh, and what is key there is that we are not aiming, uh, and that's also true in the context of ground level forest monitoring. We are not aiming to, uh, uh, you know, uh, take samples from uh, each square meter or each plot of land or each garden and so on. This is done or from, uh, you know, check every tree. This is based on the representative sampling. So you are taking the sample from the best uh, spot and this is being determined on, the, on the, uh, certain criteria that we are uh, discussing now. And then you would extrapolate the, the conclusions for a wider area, provided there is some homogeneity in the conditions, because of course soils are, are different, so you need to have certain uh, uh, information that that uh, soil is, is of the same condition in order to be able to, to extrapolate. And across the EU, because you asked this question, uh, uh, you know, specifically across the, um, uh, the uh, uh, EU, we are uh, estimating that we need a few hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, samples uh, in order to, to get uh, minimal information in order to be able also to take measures for sustainable soil management. And we would need an increase of, uh, 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 I think, four times compared with what is being done uh, currently. So, so not huge fine. cost. You want to bring soil supervision or data to the next level for an entire continent by gathering soil samples measured in a free digit amount? Well, I would say strengthen and it's a bit uh, a similar story as in the case of uh, and rationale as in the case of forest monitoring. So data is being gathered. So it's more about strengthening and harmonizing the information so that we are speaking about the same language. And of course, having uh, agreeing on a set of indicators, which would be the same for all uh, for all EU countries. So it's strengthened in uh, building something, you know, from uh, from scratch. Perfect. Thank you. And I would love to harken back, just Julia, if you're capable of answering this, when the when does a forest hit the levels of carbon sequestration where we can talk of a noticeable effect? When does it hit the maximum? How old does a forest, a patch of forest need to be to reach like really the maximum of storage that we're looking at for a given type of forest and a given type of biome? That's a big question. Um, uh, the, the potential different studies, I mean, there's various studies out there that estimate the potential of forests. I mean, it could be, it's currently at uh, around 360 million tons of carbon that it stores, but the potential could be an additional 100 to 120, so up to, to between 460 and 480. Um, but this is really, really highly dependent on patterns over the next few years. So obviously we have to take into consideration the impacts from climate change, um, 
and, uh, and you know, what sort of measures can be taken um, to, to increase the sink um, and, and how effective they'll be because there's obviously a time lapse between, say, tree, tree planting measures. So we have the 3 billion trees measure um, and different afforestation measures across the, the EU and, and also the, the nature restoration law, which aims for, for restoration and reforestation. But this impact may, the, where we're trying to meet targets by 2040 and 2050, the impact of these types of efforts may not be realized until further on, until the turn of the next century. Um, so that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, but you know, if we continue on the current trajectory that we're on, we continue under business as usual, the sink could uh, decrease by up to 77% by the end of the century, which obviously would be um, quite, quite devastating for the forest sink. Um, so we do, so this, the impacts from natural disturbances, from climate change, and also from unsustainable practices really, really does need to be taken into consideration in different modeling um, and what's possible. So there's a huge var variation in what's, what may happen or what is possible um, by different points in time. Thank you, Julia. On that not so promising outlook, so to say, I think it's time that we start bringing this discussion to a close. And to that end, I think it's time for each one of you to give us a quick outgoing statement, starting with Ned, two or so minutes, please, go. Thanks very much, uh, Nico. It's been a very enlightening to hear the different perspectives on this. And certainly it's going to be challenging, I think, to put the, this in place in terms of collecting the data, managing the data, and then obviously working with the data. But like, I think any process, when we're at the beginning, there's a lot of, of questions, there's also a lot of nervousness, um, also from the, those who manage the forests, that they, if they have to change from the current business practices, it can be uh, quite, you know, uh, worrying to them because they're wondering what resources and costs are, are involved. But I think we've seen this with other policies put in place by the Commission. And just thinking on the whole set of Copernicus services, uh, which Tim obviously knows knows more about, but they have been under development for, I, I guess, almost two decades in various iterations. But now they've become the, the workhorse of the Commission in terms of providing long-term reliable data sets. And um, I do some work with the Climate Change Service in Copernicus. And every year around this time, and probably in the next month, their statement on climate is eagerly awaited. And it has become so really over the last few years. I mean, they've always done climate statements, uh, but it's only recently, as I, I believe the climate crisis becomes more tangible uh, to people, that there's a real appetite for this information to come out there. And what I could project, I mean, we're talking about, we've talked about what's happening in the next two to three years in terms of policy within the commission. But remember, forests take decades to grow. Um, we're talking 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So what we're doing now is, uh, is thinking of a legacy, uh, I believe, in terms of managing the forests we have, but also in planting new trees, which will become forests, which will be absorbing the car carbon in decades to come. So we really have to think long term here. So I believe by now putting in place a mechanism for monitoring our forests. And yes, I think there's still a debate. We need to, to discuss how best to do it. Uh, are we collecting the right pieces of information at the moment? Should it be stepwise and so on? I think these are things that the by putting in place the, the regulation, it's getting this debate going across Europe and we're having to think about it in, in similar ways, given that we need to produce harmonized data. So I think this is really uh, vital and, and uh, timely, and it's not going to be solved overnight. Maybe just turning very briefly uh, in, in conclusion towards my own uh, area of expertise in the satellite remote sensing, um, I think these, having the Copernicus Sentinel satellites in place is absolutely fantastic. Uh, 30 years ago, this wouldn't be able to happen. Uh, Sentinel was a game changer in terms of putting in place operational satellites, so it gave confidence to people like me that we have data for the future that will be reproducible, that will be the same using these very satellite systems. So it's reassuring to know that uh, that program is in place. We will have reliable satellite data complemented obviously by private actors, which are allowing us to calculate these parameters, which are already being 
uh, worked on by many private companies, by many institutions across Europe. So I think this is an occasion for us to work maybe a little closer together and to harmonize how we produce the actual forest information that will be of most use. So I believe that we're at the beginning of, of an exciting period for forestry and that uh, with the remote sensing technologies that we have in place, they will be, I think, become the workhorse of this. And just to maybe reassure you, Hal, a little bit, I believe remote sensing can already provide quite a bit of the information on uh, forest crown health, at least, and act as early warning systems for things like the invasions of uh, bark beetle or the changes in the uh, the foliar levels and the health of trees. So I believe we have that information. So it is perhaps making it more available and also just harmonizing to some extent what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, did that make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside to have your work so openly acknowledged? Off to you for your concluding statement. Exactly, that's exactly how I felt. Thanks a lot, Ned. It confirms what, what, we, what we hope and what we think and what we feel, but we often have that feedback that uh, the Copernicus program is really doing a, a good job for many years, by the way, we celebrated our 25th anniversary last year so we are we are there for a while already um, we try to provide all the the data which is needed for um, for the eu policies we will co keep on doing this uh, the copernicus services are providing this for free so the one of the the taglines of copernicus is full free and open access to all data that goes for all the core data that we uh, provide um, it goes for all of the forest indicators and data that I know of in the Copernicus uh, system. So please use it. And, and if you have questions, don't hesitate to contact me again uh, so we can, we can help you further. Apart from this core data, Copernicus is always um, building on, on several uh, um, step stones. We all also provide these data to uh, downstream providers who are commercial providers and who can um, package the, the core data or, or the, the, the core products into very um, um, uh, ready-made final data for the end user. So there are a lot of services, there are a lot of play players in the field who will provide exactly what you need. But of course, we will keep on evolving and keep on uh, uh, generating new products, bringing them in line with all the EU policies, and I hope you will be able to to use all that in the future. Um, having said that, I think I only can invite you for the Copernicus workshop in a couple of weeks. So, hopes, hope, hopefully, we see you there. Remember, folks, I think it's on the 12th of March. <laughs> Off to you, Julia, for your concluding statement. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. Um, so. Just to, to follow up on my previous statement, I don't want to leave you all in a negative note uh, about what's possible uh, for force. So I think the, the force monitoring framework, this is going to be a, a crucial piece of legislation for helping to achieve EU climate goals. So, so particularly um, focusing on avoided emissions and, and uh, you know, the monitoring of old growth and primary forests, this is going to be essential to protecting existing carbon sink. Um, and so obviously this is, this is fundamental monitoring that we need, better monitoring because there is cases, as Anna brought up, cases of, of illegal felling uh, occurring across the EU. And so we need better, better indication of what's going on, a better picture of this. Um, as far as increasing removals as well, we need this to meet our climate goals. Um, this is going to really require additional efforts and it needs to be informed by interactions with like say age class distributions and the impacts of forest management practices and also expected impacts of, of climate change. So we really need up-to-date monitoring um, of these disturbances and, and it may increase and, and this is going to be crucial to developing informed policy actions. So I, I mentioned earlier, you know, the need for um, new tools for better modeling so we can make better informed policy actions. There's currently three horizon projects, uh, Forest Navigator, Forest Pass, and Pathfinder. And these projects are trying to, to um, emerge and, and harmonize data so that they can make these types of, they can create policy toolboxes where we can make these informed decisions about what kind of policy actions are needed in the near term and the long term as well. 
And also, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of ground and satellite uh, observations on the role of forests for climate adaptation. So there's actually some really interesting research that just came out of uh, the United States where forests on the, the eastern in the northeast are actually providing a cooling effect. So this is from reforestation efforts that happened 80 to 100 years ago um, and afforestation efforts in the northeast that's leading to, to cooling the land surface by one to two degrees annually. Um, and so, so compared to, to say what's going on in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. So you're seeing positive impacts um, from, from reforestation and afforestation several decades later. So, so this will be crucial in adaptation as well, not just for meeting mitigation goals, but also for adaptation strategies as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yuha, are you hearing this? You guys have a crucial role to play. <laughs> yes, we have. Uh, to start, with, I would say that the forests will always be a sink, carbon sink, no matter what. I think we need to remember the big picture and, and the, the greatest challenge is to, to decrease the use of, of fossil fuels. So, so that's the big picture. But, but in, terms the, in terms of the forest monitoring, the regulation, I, of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, the harmonized data is, is very important important that, so that we can make informed decisions in, in uh, when when preparing different kind of eu policies but on the other hand i see that there are still quite a bit of clarification to be done with uh, the current regulation or the current form of the regulation it is at the moment for example the clear ob objectives should be be gone through with member state and, and relevant stakeholders whose and data ownership is one thing, who's owning the data and how it can be used. And of course, cost considerations is, is a big thing. As we all know, it's very uh, expensive to, to get uh, to collect the forest data, although we are getting getting new techniques, but still some in some member states, there is a lot, 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 lot of things has been done for, for quite some time, but some, some other member states are perhaps in a di little bit different starting point. So, Cost consideration is always important in, in these issues as well. But at the end, I think uh, together with, with the, the forest owners, both public and, and private, and uh, with, with the commission, we can make this regulation better, but, but uh, hopefully we can solve some, some critical issues still. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, John. After you. Oh. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, also for the, the the final conclusions, which I uh, I took uh, uh, due note. Uh, well, uh, from my or our perspective, uh, rather, that's uh, um, a piece of uh, legislation which is uh, which is badly uh, uh, needed. Uh, as I said, the situation across the EU is, uh, is patchy when it comes to the harmonization, completeness of data, or rather the lack of completeness, uh, uh, and also the, the timeliness. So we would um, all benefit from putting together the data we, we have. Um, uh, also, we need to fill in some blank spots, even in more advanced member states, when it comes to certain biodiversity and climate-related indicators, which would profit, actually, because this uh, all the functions of the, the forest are closely connected. So knowing more on biodiversity, it may give you some insight into the health and the condition of the, the forest and how to protect it. Then I would reiterate the fact that this is about uh, is about uh, monitoring, so the getting uh, getting the data. It's not about prescribing uh, to member states or forest owners how to manage their forest. They would need to draw their conclusions uh, for uh, for themselves. Uh, we included and i didn't comment on this but that's probably an important uh, point to make uh, this uh, long-term planning uh, that's voluntary in the in the proposal but the idea behind it is that we would like um, uh, that this data which will be very valuable it's used for the long term uh, establishing certain strategies for forest management 
in long term, but in the member states uh, and with the, the uh, forest uh, managers, uh, not by the uh, by the EU. Of course, well, uh, all points are open for uh, for the legislative uh, process, and we are taking due note of, of that. Then another important aspect uh, in terms of uh, conclusions is that uh, we have um, uh, very much uh, listened to the, the experts, also the stakeholders uh, during the preparation of these proposals. So uh, uh, we think that the efforts are measured uh, and balanced. Um, uh, also the Commission and also in terms of costs, uh, something that I didn't mention, but it is in the proposal for the remote sensing. The Commission uh, proposes to to finance uh, the the efforts under the remote uh, sensing, but also leaving open to the more advanced member states to contribute their own uh, uh, their uh, own data. Right. Of course, we are open to discuss all the all the the indicators, but we think that we what we put on the table uh, and they are not so many uh, uh, indicators there. Uh, they are all important to build uh, up this coherent picture to allow us to know the condition of the uh, the, the forest. Thank you. Also, the... probably uh, last not <laughs> but not uh, not least. It's also a timely proposal. Uh, it is something, for example, we discussed a lot about uh, remote sensing and so on. Uh, the technology has advanced a lot. So something that we couldn't uh, uh, have, uh, you know, in terms of uh, satellite and even uh, uh, LIDAR. So it's kind of, uh, you know, not, uh, images taken by, by drones and, and so on. Something which could not be done uh, 10 years ago we can take advantage uh, of the technology today. There are many uh, uh, or several companies also providing this, this data, which could also uh, provide the services across the EU uh, and take advantage of this proposal. Thank you. And the actual I last it here. is going to be Anna. Please keep it short because we're already over time. Yes, thank you, Niklaus. Thank you uh, to everybody for this discussion. I would like to invite you to look at the recording from a conference that we've done as Green EFAS in the European Parliament. It's called Forests Hidden Secrets. I was really astonished um, how um, beautiful those systems are, how different they are all over the world in the different countries. So if you want to have a look how those monitoring system on the ground and on the sky look like, it's really interesting conference. It's recorded. Uh, please have a look. And my um, last statement uh, would be that we need the EU countries with strong forestry sectors to really go forward with a good forest monitoring law. We need them because, first of all, they have a lot of expertise so you can see it in the conference the the best and the, the really good systems are coming of course from countries where you have strong forestry sectors but also we see that are the countries that they don't um have some um maybe some fear to stepping in uh, common sharing how to do this monitoring so please be with us uh, because we need uh, this country and this political force and at the end we we need some pragmatic solution but of course we have to um to uh, invest in this um, monitoring system and adaptation and uh, existing system on, on, and creating some somewhere in europe when you don't have some but the benefits, they're really, really good for everybody. Um, if we're thinking about prevention against wildfire, if we could have some uh, really good um, indicators uh, and see where the wildfire can come or the epidemics that we had before, that is an eno uh, enormous economic benefit for everybody. So um, I'm really keen on to keep on this discussion and uh, to stay really pragmatic, uh, having a good forest monitoring law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Thank you all for your insightful inputs, your sharing your expertise. Thank you, everybody participating in the chat. Thank you for your copious amounts of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them. This has been the Euroactive debate on the future of EU forests and the new EU monitoring framework for forests, supported by Life Terrace. You can always stay up to date with us at the hashtag EA Debates, and then I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.